Now let's take up the gray matter of the spinal cord. What you're looking over here is an illustration of a horizontal slice which has been taken through the spinal cord. We already know that on a cut section, the gray matter is basically an H-shaped pillar with the anterior and the posterior gray columns. And sometimes there's a lateral gray horn or the lateral gray column in the spinal cord as well. The gray matter consists mainly of neuronal cell bodies. So let's summarize some of the important neuronal cell bodies or cell groups in the posterior, in the lateral, and the anterior gray horns of the spinal cord. And we'll take them up in detail later, one by one. Starting with the posterior gray horn, there are four important neuronal cell groups over here. Two of them extend throughout the length of the spinal cord, whereas the other two are restricted only in the thoracic and the lumbar regions of the spinal cord. Those two which extend throughout the length of the spinal cord in the posterior horn, these include the substantia gelatinosa, which is shown in gray over here, and the nucleus proprius, which is color-coded in green over here. While the remaining two, which do not extend throughout the length of the spinal cord, these include the dorsal nucleus of Clark, or also known as the Clark column, which is uh, shown, which is color coded in red over here, and then there is a visceral afferent nucleus, which is just lateral to the Clark's column in the posterior horn of the spinal cord, and that is shown in yellow or in orange over here. Next. After the posterior horn, we've also got a lateral gray horn of the spinal cord, which only extends from the T1 to L2 segments of the spinal cord, which means from the first thoracic to the second lumbar segment. So that means that the lateral horn is not going to be situated in the cervical region and in the lower lumbar regions. Inside the lateral horn, we can find an intermedial lateral group of cells, which, which basically give rise to the preganglionic sympathetic nerve fibers. A similar group of cells can also be found in the S2 to S4 segments from the second to the fourth sacral segments of the spinal cord. However, those cell groups would be uh, giving rise to the preganglionic parasympathetic autonomic motor neurons. Lastly, we've got the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord and the nerve cells in the anterior gray horn can be divided into three basic groups. These include the medial the intermediate or the central group of cells and then we've got the lateral group of neuronal cell bodies all color coded in purple over here. Now that we have enlisted all the major neuronal groups in the anterior, posterior and the lateral gray horns of the spinal cord, let's take them up in detail one by one. So let's begin by discussing a group of cells in the posterior horn which is known as the substantia gelatinosa. The substantia gelatinosa group of cells are present at the apex of the posterior gray horn of the spinal cord, as you can see over here as well. These are present throughout the length of the spinal cord. And what's the function of substantia gelatinosa? Well, the substantia gelatinosa is linked with the receiving sensory information uh, regarding pain and temperature. The afferent neurons bringing in the sensory information of pain and temperature from the body shown in gray over here. These travel through the spinal nerve and the posterior root of the spinal nerve to enter into the posterior gray horn of the spinal cord into the substantia gelatinosa. Here, these neurons will synapse with the neuronal cell bodies inside the substantia gelatinosa group of cells. The sensory information of pain and temperature is then going to be carried up to the higher brain center, such as the thalamus via the lateral spinal spinal thalamic tract shown in gray over here. Now in the horizontal slice of the spinal cord here, you can actually see cut sections of various ascending white matter tracts as well as the descending motor tracts as well. We will talk about these tracts in, uh, in subsequent lectures on the spinal pathways in much more detail. One thing which you can notice over here is that the neuronal fibers, once they ascend in the spinal inside the spinal cord or inside the central nervous system, they're going to cross at certain points. And this crossing is known as decussation. And that is what is being shown over here as well. You can see that the second order motor neuron, once they pop out of the substantia gelatinosa, they are going to cross over here somewhere inside the spinal cord. Uh, this crossing is known as decussation. And we'll talk about those uh, 
We'll talk about the different tracks decussating at different points as we talk about the neuronal pathways in detail in subsequent lectures. However, for now, what you have to know is that different ascending as well as the descending pathways that cross at different points in the spinal cord or in different points at different regions inside the central nervous system. And this decussation is, and this crossing is known as the decussation. One more thing which you have to know is that the substantia gelatinosa also receives input from the descending fibers coming from various supraspinal levels, hence the sensory information of pain and temperature inside the substantia gelatinosa can potentially get modified or it can get modulated by the excitatory or the inhibitory influence coming from various supraspinal levels, including the cerebral cortex. We'll talk about this phenomenon in much more detail as part of the pain modulation in a subsequent video. Now let's talk about a group of cells which is known as the nucleus proprius. The nucleus proprius group of cells are situated anterior to the substantia gelatinosa and you can see that over here these, these are color coded in green over here. They constitute the main bulk of cells present inside the posterior gray column. The, like the substantia gelatinosa, the nucleus proprius also is present throughout the length of the spinal cord, present in all the segments of the spinal cord. The cells in the nucleus proprius are linked with the sensory neuronal pathways carrying the touch information pertaining to vibration, proprioception, and two-point discrimination. The neurons bringing in the sensory information of vibration, proprioception, or two-point discrimination, these travel through the spinal nerve and then through the posterior root of the spinal nerve to enter into the posterior horn of the spinal cord, as you can see over here. These neuronal fibers are then going to ascend in the posterior white column. The sensory information is then going to be carried up to the higher brain centers through the posterior white column. The posterior white column is shown over here and it can be divided into two subregions. The red color coded region over here is known as the fasciculus gracilis and the green color coded region here is known as fasciculus cuneatus. Along their course, the first order neurons which are ascending inside the posterior white column, they are going to give a neuronal branch to the neural cell bodies inside the nucleus proprius and thus informing these group of cells about that sensory piece of information regarding vibration, proprioception and two-point discrimination which is being carried up to the higher brain centers. Okay, so now let's discuss about the next group of cells which is the Clark's column or the dorsal nucleus of Clark. The neurons bringing in sensory information of proprioception from the muscle spindles, for instance, they travel through the spinal nerve and through the posterior root of the spinal nerve to enter into the posterior gray horn, which you can see over here. Here, these neurons, they will synapse with the neuronal cell bodies inside the nucleus dorsalis group of cells into the Clark's column. The sensory information of proprioception is then going to be carried up to the higher brain centers, such as the cerebellum, via the spinocerebellar pathways. These are the spinocerebellar pathways. You're looking at the cut sections of the spinocerebellar pathways shown over here. These are color coded in red and there are two spinocerebellar pathways in our spinal cord. We've got an anterior spinocerebellar pathway and then we've got a posterior spinocerebellar pathway. And we'll talk about these pathways in detail in subsequent videos when we talk about the spinal ascending and descending pathways in much more detail. Then we've got the visceral afferent nucleus. This is a group of cells which is situated just lateral to the Clark's column, so more or less once again at the base of the posterior gray horn, but a little bit lateral to the Clark's column. This is color coded in yellow over here. It extends from the T1 to L2 segments of the spinal cord, which means from the first thoracic to the second lumbar segment, and therefore this is also not situated throughout the length of the spinal cord. It is believed to be associated with receiving visceral afferent information. So lastly, we've got neuronal cell groups situated in the anterior horn of the spinal cord. The nerve cells in the anterior gray horn can be divided into three basic subgroups or subcolumns. These include the medial, the central or the intermediate, and then the lateral group of neuronal cell bodies. All of those have been shown color coded in purple over here. The motor or the efferent neurons, they are going to emerge from these neuronal cell bodies and then they, these neurons are going to pass into the anterior roots to reach into the spinal nerves.
the efferent or the motor neurons which pop out from the medial, intermediate, and the lateral group of neuronal cell bodies inside the anterior horn, they can be divided into two broad main categories. Those are the alpha efferents and the gamma efferents. The alpha efferents, they innervate, innervate the large extra fusal skeletal muscle fibers, whereas the gamma efferents, these innervate the small intrafusal muscle fibers which are present as part of the neuromuscular spindles. Now, the medial group of neuronal cell bodies inside the anterior horn, they are situated in most of the segments of the spinal cord. The neurons from these neuronal cell bodies, they are going to innervate mainly our axial musculature, which is present close to the midline. So, the muscles such as the skeletal muscles of the neck and the trunk, the intercostal muscles, the abdominal musculature, these are going to be innervated by these efferent neurons which are going to pop out from the medial group of cells inside the anterior gray horn. Now the lateral group is present only in the cervical and the lumbosacral regions of the spinal cord and these innervate our appendicular musculature such as the upper limbs and the lower limbs. The lateral neuronal groups present inside the cervical region of the spinal cord would innervate the upper limb, whereas the lateral neuronal group of cells inside the lumbosacral region, they are going to innervate the lower limb musculature. Then lastly, the central or the intermediate group of cells inside the anterior gray horn, these include phrenic nucleus and the spinal accessory nucleus. The phrenic nucleus, that spans from the C3 to C5 segments of the spinal cord, from the third cervical to the fifth cervical spinal segments. And this nucleus is concerned mainly with innervating our skeletal muscle of respiration, which is the diaphragm. While the spinal accessory nucleus that exists in the upper five or six segments of the cervical spinal cord, and that is mainly linked with innervating muscle muscle in, with innervating the skeletal muscle such as the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid. Now that we know about the important neuronal groups present inside the posterior lateral and the gray anterior gray horns of the spinal cord, let's just briefly talk about the gray commissure and the central spinal canal. So what is a gray commissure? Well, gray commissure is a thin strip of gray matter which is, which, is, which is surrounding the central spinal canal along with the anterior and the posterior white commissure and it connects the two lateral halves of the cord. So it's, it's connecting the gray horn on the right side with the gray horn on the left side and it comprises the lamina 10 in the Rex classification. The spinal canal shown in the center over here is part of the ventricular system of the central nervous system. So when we talk about the central nervous system, there is a system of ventricles present inside it. For instance, when we go to the cerebral hemispheres, there are two large lateral ventricles present in each of the hemispheres, one ventricle in each of the hemisphere. Then there is a third ventricle which is situated inside the diencephalon. And if you go down further, then there is a fourth ventricle which is situated more or less in the region where the brainstem is present with the medulla and palms in the front and the cerebellum at the back and then the fourth ventricle continues down into the spinal cord forming what is known as the spinal canal and that is the one the central canal which you can see down below over here this is part of the ventricular system this, this is the spinal component of the ventricular system the ventricular system is all filled up with a fluid which is known as the cerebrospinal fluid and we'll talk about that in some subsequent video when we talk about the meninges and the ventricles in much more more detail. Now that we know about the structural details of the spinal cord as well as the spinal nerve and we've gone through the various neuronal cell groups inside the anterior posterior and the lateral gray horns of the spinal cord, how about if we talk about the spinal nerve from a functional perspective as well? Right, so now for that, let's have a look at this picture over here. See, this is a horizontal slice which has been taken through the spinal cord. We can see the H-shaped, butterfly-shaped gray matter over here. These are the posterior horns, these are the lateral horns, and these are the anterior horns over here. Then the gray matter can be seen surrounded by the white matter. Here is the motor root, which is the efferent root 
and here is the sensory or the dorsal root. Uh, this is the accumulation of the neuronal cell bodies over here outside the spinal cord, hence that would be called as a ganglia. And since this is situated inside the dorsal root, we're going to call it as the dorsal root ganglion. The motor or the ventral root is going to combine with the sensory or the dorsal root over here to form what is known as the spinal nerve. The spinal nerve is then going to exit through the intervertebral foramen and it's going to split up into an anterior ramus and a posterior ramus, which is not shown over here. This entire X-shaped orientation of structure is actually the spinal nerve. So the two roots over here, the sensory root at the back and the motor root in the front, and then the anterior and the posterior rami, and in the middle we've got the stem of the X, which is the actual spinal nerve. Now inside the spinal nerve we've got both sensory neurons as well as motor neurons. The sensory neurons bring in information into the CNS, while the motor neurons, they bring information outside the central nervous system to the effector organs, for instance, the muscles or the glands. Notice that the spinal nerve is actually a mixed structure, meaning thereby that there are both sensory as well as the motor neurons present inside the spinal nerve. However, the two function categories of neurons are separate from each other at this point. So inside the motor roots and inside the sensory root over here, we're going to have either purely motor neuron or purely sensory neuron. So the roots are basically purely motor or purely sensory, whereas the spinal nerves, that is the point where the roots combined together, the motor neurons, sensory neurons combined together to form the spinal nerve. So inside the spinal nerve, as well as in the rema anterior or the posterior, we're going to see both sensory as well as the motor neurons. So the nerves and the rema are going to be mixed structures. Then the neurons could either be somatic neurons or they could be visceral neurons. So that's another functional way of dividing the, the neuron into somatic and the visceral categories. And so consequently, we've got four different categories of neurons. We've got the general somatic afferent neurons, we've got general somatic efferent neurons, and we've got general visceral afferent neurons, and we've got general visceral efferent neurons. Now let's see how these different types of neurons fit into the functional working of a nerve. A general somatic afferent neuron, for instance, that travels through the posterior ramus or through the anterior ramus, depending upon whichever part of the body it's coming from, it's going to travel through the rami, then it's going to travel through the spinal nerve over here to enter into the posterior root to bring in the sensory information into the spinal cord. It's going to synapse over here. It, its cell bodies are going to be situated inside the dorsal root ganglion. The neuron is then going to enter into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord where it is going to synapse with the interneuron inside the gray horn. The interneuron then synapses with the cell body of a general somatic efferent motor neuron on the same side or on the opposite side as well. The motor neuron then exits through the motor root and joins up with the sensory root right over here. That is the point where the spinal nerve is going to form. So this is a mixed structure. Now as you can see both the motor and sensory neurons passing through it. This motor neuron passes through the spinal nerve and it can then travel either through the posterior ramus or through the anterior ramus depending on whichever structure it is going to innervate. For instance, this motor neuron could travel, let's say, through the posterior, through the anterior ramus to enter into the skeletal muscle of the upper limb or the lower limbs, or it might actually go through the posterior ramus to innervate the skeletal muscles of the posterior body wall, for example, causing these muscles to contract, bringing, thus bringing about a motor effector response. Now, inside the T1 to L2 segments of the spinal cord, which means from the first thoracic to the second lumbar segments of the spinal cord, we've got an additional gray horn present over here, which is the lateral gray horn. But what are these lateral gray horns for? Well, these are the locations of the, of the autonomic neuronal cell bodies, specifically the sympathetic autonomic neuronal cell bodies. Uh, so here the visceral information, let's say from the GI mucosa, let's say because of the irritation of the GI mucosa, some sensory information from the visceral organs is going to be entering into the posterior horn of the spinal cord. This sensory information from a visceral organ such as the GI mucosa is going to be brought in by a gen general visceral afferent neuron. That is shown over here with this color-coded 
that is shown over here with this with this dotted red color coded line you can see the general visceral efferent neuron traveling through the anterior ramus in this case over here it passes through the spinal nerve and then enters into the dorsal root the cell body of this neuron is situated inside the dorsal root ganglion the neuron is then going to enter into the posterior horn and then inside the posterior gray horn it is going to synapse with the visceral afferent nuclei in the posterior horn these then can be connected with the motor neuronal cell bodies inside the lateral gray horn. The autonomic motor system is divided into a preganglionic and a postganglionic motor neuronal system. The lateral gray horn over here contains cell bodies of the preganglionic sympathetic motor neuron, which then travel through the motor root. These sympathetic preganglionic motor neurons are then going to pass through the through the spinal nerve, and from there they're going to enter through the anterior ramus into the sympathetic neuronal trunk. The sympathetic neuronal trunk contains a series of ganglions inside it. The ganglions are nothing but accumulation of neuronal cell bodies. These are actually the cell bodies of the postganglionic neurons. And so the preganglionic motor neuron is going to synapse with the cell bodies of the postganglionic sympathetic motor neuron inside a ganglion of the sympathetic trunk. Now the postganglionic sympathetic motor neuron is then going to travel through this gray ramus community and it's going to enter back into the anterior ramus. From the anterior ramus, it can either go through the anterior ramus to supply any autonomic motor structure or it can actually go through the posterior ramus to supply any autonomic motor structure, let's say a blood vessel or a gland in the posterior body wall depending on whichever structure it has to be inner depending on whichever structure needs to be innervated the postganglion sympathetic motor neuron is going to be traveling either through the posterior ramus or through the anterior ramus here we can see the postganglionic sympathetic motor neuron traveling through the posterior ramus innervating the vessel uh, the musculature of the blood vessels causing for example, to cause vasodilatation, or it's going to the sweat glands over here to cause uh, secretion of the sweat. Or you can see over here the postcranial sympathetic motor neuron traveling through the anterior ramus and then entering into the gastrointestinal tract, where it's going to cause, let's say, the muscular, let's say, the contraction of the smooth muscles, leading to peristalsis. Hence, we've actually seen over here four different categories of neurons. We've talked about the somatic, efferent, and efferent neurons forming a kind of a reflex arc control controlling a somatic function. And we've talked about the visceral afferent and efferent neurons again forming a kind of a reflex arc controlling an autonomic function. So just to recap, in this lecture, we talked about the structural details of the spinal cord and we talked about the structural components of the spinal nerve as well. We dealt with the different neuronal cell groups in the posterior and here in the lateral gray horns of the spinal cord. And we touched a little bit on the functional side of the spinal nerve as well. We talked about the different visceral, afferent and efferent neurons and we talked about the e and we talked about the somatic afferent and efferent neurons inside the spinal nerve as well. So thank you very much for listening. Hope you benefited from the lecture. If yes, please do like the video and don't forget to subscribe the channel. In some subsequent video, we'll be talking in detail now about the ascending and the descending spinal pathways. Bye for now.